Welcome back to 8701. So we start a new chapter now, QCD or quantum chromodynamics. And in this first lecture of this chapter, we talk about the production of hadrons. Um, this is really meant as an introductory lecture, but we will also already see some very interesting and useful concepts. So we want to produce quarks and anti-quark pairs. Um, and we do this in electron position collisions. We have studied in detail this first part of the diagram already. Um, specifically, we calculated the cross-section of electron uh, of muon and anti-muon production. And we also have seen what changes then we have same time particle in the final state, so the you know electron positron scattering to electron positron. So now we will place the muons with our quarks and anti-quark pairs. And it's, as a first step, we want to remind ourselves of the available quarks in this discussion. So we have the up quark, the down quark, charm, strange, top and bottom. You see that the charges are given here and the photon couples to the charge. So the charge is not one, but it's either two thirds or minus one third. Um, we have also here in this table, masses given for those particles. They range from a few MeV to 173 GeV for the top quark. Um, the bottom quark is about five GeV heavy. Um, remember, when we discuss um, discussed renormalization, we discussed that those masses are not fixed parameters, but in our perturbation theory, they run like the couplings one. So this might cause um, some uh, difficulties later on. Okay, so now we want to produce an up quark and an anti up quark in those collisions. What happens? So in our collisions, then you know we produce those quark particles. So let's say there's an up quark and an anti up here, and then you plus the minus collision. Um, those quarks only live for a very short time or travel a very short distance in space, about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And then they start to pull in out of the vacuum um, gluons and quarks and anti-quark pairs. And those then, then form um, into the actual hadrons after some time. And those two pictures here, they look very much the same. Um, the difference is in the way we treat the hadronization, the actual fact of forming hadrons. In this first picture, we are thinking about clustering energy particles together and that way form hadrons. In this picture here, we connect them with so-called strings. And those are two different ways to model and, and model the uh, production of hadrons. Remember, when we uh, look at this process here, we are looking at very low energy kind of, um, or lower energy kind of uh, phenomena. And at lower energies, the strength of the um, strength of the strong interaction, the strength of QCD, is the coupling is in the order of one, or can be larger than one. So perturbation theory is not possible here. That's why we need specific models. This is all I want to say at this point. We come back to this discussion later on. What I actually want to discuss is, you know, what we can learn out of measuring cross section of hadron production. Um, for example, by comparing directly the cross-section of, of quark anti quark pair production with a cross-section we just calculated for muon anti muon production. And experimental results are given here. So you see as a function of energy, here from 1 GeV to uh, 7 GeV center of mass energy, and in the lower plot, just continuing from about 10 to 60 GeV. What you see here is that there is a rich structure um, so you see those resonance here. And you also see that there seem to be some sort of increase in this in the value of this ratio. So how can we now understand this? At leading order, uh, we can just write this down. We just calculated the cross section for electron uh, muon scattering or for electron muon, muon production. Um, and we can write this very same cross section at leading order for quark anti quark production. What we find as differences is the coupling, uh, the coupling itself. Um, here we have to use the charge of the quarks and not the charge of the electron. So there's an additional factor here, one third or two thirds squared. And then there is um, the number of possible quark pairs which are available. And that depends on the number of colors. Remember each quark appears with three different colors. So we have to account for this factor. All right, and then we build the ratio and the ratio, everything just cancels out. Great. Um, so we have just the number of colors times the sum 
of the charges squares of the quarks available. What do I mean by the quarks available? As we go from, from lower energies to higher energies in this plot here, the kinematic, the, the energy is sufficient to produce particles based on the masses available. So we find that this explains the step function. Let's look at a specific example. So if we look at center of mass energies, which are larger than two times the mass of the bottom quark, and maybe lower than two times the mass of the top quark, we are in this specific regime here. And you see this is almost flat, and the number we get is almost four, okay? What we get from this leading order calculation is three times four over nine for our up quark, uh, one over nine for down, one over nine for charm, uh, strange, four over nine for charm, and one over nine for our bottom quark. Okay, so we built the sum here for all quarks which are kinematically available. And as an answer, we get 11 over three. So this is in very good agreement at leading order, in very good agreement with the experimental results. And 11 over three is almost four. Excellent. So this is clear indication, experimental indication that, uh, you know, this color factor here is a real thing. You know, there seem to be three up quarks, three down quarks, three sharp quarks, and so on. Um, and we also see that this leading order effect here, the leading order calculation is already very precise. And the reason for this is that, that this process here is a QED process. So the, the, the production cross-section is a QED process as we just discussed. So now why do I actually have this as part of our QCD introduction? First, you learned about the color factor here, okay? And second, there is indeed corrections. And one of the correction is the one where you actually produce a real gluon in the final state. And those corrections uh, can be calculated. Um, if you go to higher order, you get a correction from this, which, uh, from this, from this radiated gluon. You also get corrections which look like this, vertex corrections, and you find that the correction here <clears throat> to R is about one plus alpha S at a specific scale over pi. Now at a reasonable scale, this is then, you know, about 0 0.1 is the value of alpha S and pi is 3.14. And so you get about a few percent, 3% correction to the R value. Great. Why is this so important? I mean, it's a small correction. It's a percent or few percent level correction. What is really important is that this process here can be used in order to um, demonstrate the existence of, of gluons. And so gluons have been discovered this way. And the way this was done is, you know, by producing E plus E minus um, collisions and detecting three bunches of particles, two from the quarks and one from the gluon. And then, then to identify that this gluon here is actually a gluon, and not some other particle, one can look at angular distributions, one can identify that this is a spin one particle and so on. So there's a little bit more work needed in, beyond just showing that there are three jets, but identifying this kind of topology in E plus E minus collisions led to the discovery of gluons in this kind of collisions. So that was my introduction. As a next step, we now want to have one more step of you know, how can we learn about this kind of structures before we then dive into uh, Feynman diagrams or Feynman calculations, Feynman rules for QCDs.